Good evening and welcome to the Dongfang Hour podcast. I'm Blaine Curcio and tonight I will be introducing a new initiative from the podcast, namely the weekly China Space News Roundup. To supplement our roughly once per month podcast episodes, which require significant time spent doing research and editing, uh, we will be starting a roughly once per week news episode that aims to be a little bit more off the collar, uh, basically just uh, covering three or four news episodes of the, of the previous week uh, over the course of about 15 minutes. This week will only be me hosting. However, in the future, I will regularly be joined by my co-host, uh, Jean Deville. Um, we will be aiming to bring you news and information that is current, that is relevant, and that is presented with the relevant context that is required. Uh, with all of that being said, just a couple of notes for today's episode. Uh, I'm recording both an audio and video version of this this episode. Uh, on the video version, I'm going to start a screen share in a moment that is going to involve uh, me showing the, the various web pages of the news articles that I am referring to. So if you're listening to the audio version, um, no need to worry, we will include the links to those web pages in the show notes. But in the meantime, uh, you may need to uh, have a, an active uh, visual imagination to, to uh, imagine some of the things that we're talking about here on, on the video version. Uh, finally, one last housekeeping note for the, uh, again, for the video version on the websites, most of the articles that I will be referencing were originally in Chinese. And for this episode, I have just used the default Google Translate within the Google Chrome browser to just translate the whole article into Chinese. Uh, just it's the easiest way of doing it. Um, I, you know, but, but I, I make no guarantees for the accuracy of, of Google Translate. Uh, in the, in the context of this episode. So with all of that being said, I'm going to start my, my screen share and uh, we are going to get into our discussion of our articles for, for this week. Ladies and gentlemen, we are honored to welcome you aboard the Dongfang Hour. Please make sure your seatbelt is securely fastened. Thank you. Uh, this week we are going to be talking about the IPO of a uh, of a rocket company from Shanxi Province. We will be talking about a rocket fairing washing up on the beach here in Hong Kong, uh, as well as a very uh, excellent recent interview that we recommend checking out. Uh, but first, uh, we will talk about some news from last week about the Chinese Leo Broadband Constellation uh, plans. And for those of you who have not been following this uh, business model of low Earth orbit broadband constellations, um, just a very, very brief overview. These business models basically aim to bring global broadband access via thousands or tens of thousands of satellites being launched into low Earth orbit. And so the biggest current initiative uh, of this type is SpaceX and Starlink. They have uh, about 700 or 800 satellites in orbit. Um, there's a handful of other large initiatives in Western countries, including Kuiper from Amazon and uh, OneWeb, which was recently uh, kind of bailed out of bankruptcy by the UK government and Marty Airtel. So basically, this is a business model that has been um, really in the media a lot lately and attracting sums of money that are unusually large for the space industry. And for some time now, we've been talking about, uh, you know, the Chinese response to these constellations. And there have been a couple of projects announced by Chinese state-owned enterprises, namely Hongyan and Hongyun and Xingyun. Um, and for more information about those, I suggest checking out our episode four, where we interview Lan Tianyi about these business models. Um, but basically, these several projects, they had been announced and they were relatively smaller by a order of magnitude compared to, say, Starlink. So, for example, Hongyan was a few hundred satellites compared to Starlink being 10,000. And so, this all being said, in China, there has been for the last year or so, a lot of, of kind of under the radar discussion about um, the, the kind of bigger Chinese constellation project that just has not really been announced yet. And implicitly, this project is going to be done by a state-owned company, probably Cask and, and some combination of partners. And um, again, this has been just sort of talked about by a lot of people in the industry as sort of an unofficially known thing. And so last week, um, we had an article published by a private, uh, or let's say a a non-state affiliated media source in China. It's a space uh, news source called Xiaohuojian. That's like a small rocket is the literal uh, translation. And they're, they're a pretty well-established sort of independent space news source. They've been publishing on the Chinese internet for maybe 
uh, I, five or more years, I guess. Um, and they're, they're quite good. And they published this article talking about, uh, you know, details for the Chinese uh, low Earth orbit broadband constellation and, you know, plans to, to file for the, the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union, um, for this, this constellation. And so as we see here on, on this, um, this article that I'm showing the, the, the video version, um, this is the one part of the article that did not translate from Chinese, but it's the table showing the different constellations. And basically this news from last week um, it showed seven sub-constellations that are part of two larger constellations, and the total is about 13,000 satellites. And again, this was published by uh, Xiao Jian, this uh, non-state affiliated media source, and it did not really say anywhere in this article, um, you know, who was going to be launching these satellites, or who's going to be building them, or who, who's going to be operating the constellation. It, it was basically just this is what the constellation is going to look like in a very, you know, in a fairly precise way. We see here they have the orbital, um, the orbital altitude in, in 508 kilometers to 590 kilometers. We have the uh, inclination, the number of satellites per, per plane, and, or sorry, the number of planes, the number of satellites per, per plane. Um, so fairly precise uh, details here. Um, and so strangely, this article got taken down about 24 hours after it was published. And we have yet thus far not seen anything like it reposted. And um, it's an interesting development. We don't really know what, uh, what happened with the, you know, well, we don't really know what the situation is. However, um, based on speculation, this is being, this is my personal speculation. Um, Xiao Huo Dian, again, it's a, it's a known, it's a sort of legitimate uh, space news source. And I, I think it is very unlikely that they would have published something like this knowing that it would be apparently a leak or something because again, it was taken down and, and for whatever reason, uh, the fact that it was taken down make, makes me think that somebody did not want this to be, it was published before it was expected to be published. Um, and I think it's very, very likely that would have been accidental from by, by Xiao Guojian. I don't think they would have intentionally uh, done something like that, which makes me think that it, would have had to be plausible that whatever document this came from was a final document, or at least fairly close to final. I, I think it's very unlikely that on day one of the Constellation, uh, you know, ITU planning, you know, the, the sort of assuming that there's some internal planning process within China for ITU filing preparation, uh, had it been the sort of day one document of, of that preparation process, I think it's unlikely that a news source that clearly knows what they are doing in general would have mistaken it as uh, as not being you know for public release let's say um, again that's speculation by me i don't i don't know but this is my my feeling is that basically the implication is that the numbers that we see here um are are essentially uh probably fairly close to the numbers that we will see uh, whenever they do file at the itu now, another interesting thing that came out of this uh, this news from last week is the, I guess the sort of pre the the, the GW um, the GW prefix to the the constellation plans at the ITU. Uh, so I had a colleague of mine point out to me that in the I, in the public ITU filings now there are filings for other GW constellation plans. So it's GW and then GW hyphen one and GW hyphen S, I think. And there are also plans for big-ish constellations that were uh, filed by China, I think, last year. Um, but yeah, I think it's certainly, it, it's, uh, so basically, if, if you know, summarizing this article and, and the importance of this, um, I think this is the first really rather concrete uh, evidence that we have seen for an expanded constellation plan by China. And again, this is not an official media source. These numbers appear to not be final. But it is a very detailed plan of a much larger scale than, let's say, Hongyan or Hongyun uh, or Xingyun, which are the three other state-owned uh, state enterprise constellation plans. So um, this one we, we will not be able to, to actually link in the show notes because it was taken down. Uh, but a very good article from, from Xiao Huozian from Little Rockets or Small Rockets. Um, and, and just a really interesting, um, I guess, mystery as to, to why it got taken down and what the situation is there. So yeah, um, so Chinese Lo, uh, Leo Broadband Constellations and some, some interesting things going on there. Uh, so now moving over to uh, the IPO of the um, of Shanxi Zhongtian rocket. So um, 
to give a, bit, a brief bit of background, Shanxi Dongtian Rocket is a cask subsidiary that manufactures rockets and, and related uh, rocket engines and components, this kind of um, a variety of, uh, it's a sort of subsystems level rocket manufacturer. And it appears to be, so again, it's a cask subsidiary and, and likely they're in a CALT subsidiary with CALT being the main uh, launch service provider within CASC. And this is, um, it's not the first time that we've seen a CASC subsidiary have an IPO. And it's an interesting example of um, this sort of what the Chinese would probably refer to as either uh, opening up or, or reform or, or uh, some combination thereof. But basically this idea of having some relatively small percentage of state-owned enterprises, in this case about 25%, uh, being publicly traded. And the most recent example in my mind before this would have been the IPO of China Satcom about a year ago. And China Satcom is also owned uh, primarily by CASC. And the, so the IPO occurred uh, last week. Again, uh, Shanxi Zhongtian Rocket is a, it's a subsidiary of CASC. Their top line revenues are about 800 million RMB. That's about 120 million US dollars per year. Um, and since the IPO, uh, we see here, their stock price has gone up the limit every single day. So in the Chinese uh, stock market, there's a 10% uh, limit. If the stock price goes up or down by 10% within a day, um, it, it can no longer go up or, or down. It, it, it's within that 10% band. And so you see just every, every single day from the IPO, it has just been a straight uh, you know, going up to the 10% and then leveling off. And the Chinese markets have been closed over the last five days or so because of the mid-autumn festival and also the national holiday. So we, we do not know whether uh, Shanxi Zhongtian rocket has uh, gone up the limit this week yet because the markets have not yet been open. But uh, it seems tomorrow we may see uh, Shanxi Zhongtian rocket go up to the limit 10% uh, once again. And... Uh, looking at the the company, I mean, I'm, I'm not a, an expert financial analyst on, on rocket companies, but but looking at the the company financials and the price to earnings ratio, it 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 seems uh, less less high than let's say China Satcom in terms of the the price to earnings ratio, which which kind of tells me there may be some room yet to run for for Shanxi Zhongtian. So for any of our listeners that have a, access to uh, buying the shares of Shanxi Zhongtian, this is certainly not financial advice by any means, but uh, as you see, they've gone up the limit uh, every day over the last several days. And uh, I, I don't know how long that will continue or if it will continue, but an interesting event nonetheless. And um, getting back to, I guess, a broader point, this, this IPOing of relatively small stakes of state-owned companies, uh, what we've now seen over these last five days is that on paper, CASC has seen their stake in Shanxi Zhongtian increase by like more than 100 million US dollars on paper. And that's not the most liquid asset, but it's still, it, it's an asset that has now increased significantly in value um, in a way that is, uh, fair, you know, pretty defensible in the sense that you say, well, there's the stock, the share price in the market is, is a fair price for this company. Um, Again, with China Satcom, it's, it's a similar thing where CASC maintains, I don't know the exact percent off the top of my head, but it would be like oh, more than 50% ownership of China Satcom. And China Satcom's share price has gone up something like four or five times since IPO. And so again, on paper, you have CASC booking these massive gains, which is an interesting, it's an interesting thing to see. Uh, I, I don't know what the long-term impact will be. I suppose it would make borrowing relatively cheaper for CASP because they would have more, um, uh, more collateral, or, you know, relatively more valuable assets as collateral. But uh, I'm not sure. But certainly, an interesting uh, development. And and again, this uh, IPO is, was was something to watch. And I, I would recommend uh, keeping an eye on on the share price over the next few days to see if it continues to go up that 10 percent. Um. So the last uh, last news article to talk about this week, and then I have a recommendation. Um, so we had uh, local news in, in Hong Kong, a rocket fairing from a Long March 5B rocket that was launched from Wenchang in May of this year. Um, it washed up on the beach in in, uh, in Cyclone, in the, in the eastern part of Hong Kong. And a colleague of mine, a former uh, colleague of mine, he uh, sent me over this article that he had written for his, uh, his company, and it, it shows uh, this is the, apparently the path of the fairing, and uh, it, was, it was made to be a, a bit of a media circus in Hong Kong. Apparently, they were not particularly amused at the large rocket fairing washing up on the beach. They were, 
they were a little bit concerned about that. But nonetheless, um, an interesting local instance of the space industry coming to me because I cannot leave Hong Kong at the moment uh, due to the ongoing pandemic and border closures associated uh, therewith. Yeah. Um, okay, so that is the last news article of the week to discuss. Again, you can find the link in the podcast notes. The last thing is a recommendation for an excellent uh, interview that occurred late last week, middle of last week, perhaps, with uh, Bavia Lal. She's uh, Dr. Bavia Lal from the uh, Institute for Defense Analyses. She's uh, based in Washington, D.C., covering a variety of, of high-tech and, and space-related industries. And she had an excellent interview with uh, Spacewatch.global for their Space Cafe series. Um, and she talked about the Chinese commercial space industry. So it's about a 33-minute long talk, and it's really um, highly recommended. So. Again, you can find that in the show notes. Uh, so with that, uh, I believe that's everything from my side. I thank you for watching, and I hope to see you again next week on the Dongfang Hour News Update. Have a great day.